Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I just want to, first of all, thank you for coming out tonight. Thanks to all our questioners. You're all lined up and ready to go. Obviously, I want to thank our Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman for being here tonight. Thank you, Governor. Good to see you. to the great Pat City, the city of Danbury, home of the lowest crime rate in Connecticut. I just want to share that with you. And uh, I certainly want to uh, thank him and certainly uh, congratulate him on coming out to the communities across Connecticut, participating in these sessions. The most important thing that all elected officials can do is listen. <laughs> certainly me and Lieutenant Governor Wyman are here to listen to all of us tonight. So. Thank you, Governor, for being here. We appreciate it. Welcome to Danbury. Thank you very much. so that people understand, and then we're going to go to the questions and handle as many of those as, uh, uh, as we can. Uh, the budget, uh, actually, you know, I was elected on uh, November 2nd. On November 15th, pursuant to uh, state statute, the uh, then Governor Jody Rell handed me a budget. Uh, that budget uh, was $3.5 billion out of uh, balance. Uh, that budget under state statute was a same services budget. So, in other words, provide the same services that we're, we're currently being funded in this budget, the one that we're now in the middle of, uh, next year would have a $3.5 billion uh, deficit. Um, some of the reasons for that is all of the stimulus money uh, has, had been used, and it had been used in ways to uh, replace state funds. All of the surplus dollars, $1.5 billion, the rainy day fund, had been exhausted. Uh, and in the current fiscal year, uh, they're borrowing $647 million to uh, sustain uh, op operating costs. Uh, when I got that budget, I had a couple of choices to make, one of which was to do the same uh, as has been done before, uh, play some uh, games or use some gimmicks uh, or borrow to operate, uh, op for operating expenses, uh, which I don't think is uh, the right way to do it, or to present a budget that was out of balance and refuse to admit it. I wasn't going to do that either. So we went to a different direction, direction two, which is change the way we do business, understand that there are tough choices, that there are no easy answers, that it was going to require a combination of spending cuts, restructuring of government, uh, and savings from employees, um, and then, and only then, increase revenue. Um, the budget framework uh, is no new base spending in the general fund. Uh, some people have pointed out that we spend more money in transportation. Uh, and we spent some more money uh, in uh, medical expenses. Those are specifically paid for in this budget. Uh, with those two exceptions, we're actually spending less money um, uh, in the coming fiscal year than the current fiscal year. Uh, we will not uh, borrow money. The budget's not based on any borrowing of money for operating expenses. For the first time, we fully fund our pension obligation to the tune of $877 million. Um, that has not been done before. Um, and uh, it, it, it's ha not having to be done before is one of the reasons we're in this country. And I've said that we will not offer early retirement programs that would further burden the fifth worst funded pension plan in the United States um, and ultimately cost us more money than it would save. Um, Connecticut's budget, uh, in this budget, we cut actually 760 uh, plus million dollars from the uh, budget the governor gave you. We structure, restructure state government agencies, so there are currently in this year's budget 81 separately funded state agencies. We cut that to 57, a 30% reduction, uh, and from that we'll develop additional savings uh, in the years to come. Uh, and we identify the level of support or savings that we need from our, uh, my fellow state employees, specifically $1 billion, and then and only then did we, ret did we turn to revenue. What do we do in this budget? We fully fund education. Um, at the, the current ECS formula uh, basis. Um, and to explain that, in the budget that I was handed would have been a gap of $271 million uh, in ECS because they had used stimulus money as the basis of cutting the ECS money uh, previously. We closed that gap. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Don't uh, uh, pass on additional obligations to local communities. I'm not uh, one of the governors who's trying to balance the state's budget on the backs of communities it's by simply passing along the expense or the obligation without uh, revenue. Uh, we have vowed to protect the safety net, and I believe we have. Uh, not, not that the safety net is on change, uh, but that it's intact. Uh, and uh, $130 million in affordable and specifically supportive housing is in this budget. The reason it's in this budget is supportive housing uh, in the long run is a way to save money by keeping people in their homes for a longer period of time or, uh, uh, or supporting them uh, uh, if they have disabilities in their own homes uh, uh, or uh, new rental units. Uh, and then we fully fund, as I said previously, uh, our pension obligations. Uh, Median income in Danbury is $68,013. Uh, additional income tax would be approximately $500 per year uh, for that family. Uh, that is $9.62 per week. It is $1.37 per day. Uh, additional sales tax based on that family income would be $59 per year, $1.14 per week, uh, or $0.16 cents per day. Um, Danbury, uh, if we had not patched the ECS hole, I know the mayor appreciates us having done that, uh, Danbury would have lost the biennium budget $6.5 million, or over $3 million per year, um, and that would have shown up in your local economy as unemployed teachers or custodians or aides, uh, or uh, additional taxes on, on the property tax uh, system. Um, We didn't kick the can down the road. We made a specific decision not to do that, to send a message to the business community that we are open for business and we need mean business. Uh, the community, uh, uh, business community, employer community has made it very clear they need stability and certainty uh, in, these economic, uh, in this economic climate. I believe we're providing that. The longer we wait to address the deficit, uh, the more uncertainty is generated and as has been proven, the deeper the hole gets. Failure to address past deficits in a meaningful way has led to downgrades in Connecticut's bond rating, uh, leading ultimately to higher interest costs. Uh, and I should point out to you that prior to 1975, Connecticut had the highest uh, bond rating possible. We're now in the bottom quartile uh, when it comes to state, uh, uh, state bonding. Uh, finally, uh, I came to the conclusion that the alternative to this budget would have been a Connecticut that we would not have recognized. This is a budget that uh, uh, I think honors our commitments to our communities uh, and to the people we serve uh, and is the right balance, but now I have to hear from everybody else. And so I, uh, uh, I think since the second one of these, this is the 16th, or next to last, uh, uh, for a while the uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor has been coming with me to these things um, and uh, uh, I want to thank her for that. She, uh, she runs the microphone. Um, and if she gives you an elbow, that means you got to get out of the way. Okay. Uh, there you go. Governor, thank you for taking the time to speak. Sure. Uh, my name is Bill Begg. Uh, I'm actually a fellow Democrat. I want to open the for the United State Representative out of Delbury. Well, I, I'm also a DR doctor. Um, I work at Delbury Hospital. I live in So I'm actually ER doctor, Danbury Hospital. I've been there for almost 20 years, and what I do is I work the graveyard shift. So I have quite. I'm a not sure a doctor should say that. Hey, <laughs> 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 I just have to speak well of you. I know it's in politics because I always had an issue with uh, political correctness. <laughs> They stuck me on this shit in the, <laughs> uh, the fact remains that when I started 20 years ago, we had one doc, two nurses, and I was sleeping at night. We, it was a great shift. Now we've tripled our staff. We cannot physically keep up with the number of patients we see. Why are we seeing a million patients in the middle of the night? Because these patients, these people are working during the day, they're trying their best to work their jobs. They have no insurance or they're underinsured or they can't get in to see their primary care doctor and they use us as a resource. We are the, I and my colleagues at Danbury Hospital are the final safety net. 
So my question is, with the proposed health care, Medicare, Medicaid uh, changes and cuts, I, I just wonder, do you think this will affect the safety net that myself and my colleagues uh, in, in the hospitals here in Connecticut uh, provide? Well, you know, I, I, we, we got a whole bunch of information in a single question. Uh, we, you know, listen, I, 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 we're one year into um, uh, the health care plan having been passed about the, a year and three weeks ago. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of good in that package, and I think a lot of change is going to come. Um, I do know that there are some people who are trying to uh, uh, roll back that clock and undo that or to starve it uh, by budget cuts, but I think it's the right thing, for instance, in, 2014, small businesses will qualify for a 40% rebate um, on uh, their contribution to employee-based health care. Uh, I think that's an important uh, uh, direction to go in. Uh, we have a legal obligation to, uh, uh, to serve people at our hospitals, uh, and we have to do that. Uh, that's going to stay uh, in place. Uh, and my administration's worked very hard uh, to implement all of the, the changes that this uh, law that was passed a year ago uh, uh, meet, uh, require uh, each and every year uh, between now and 2014 and then ultimately uh, uh, to operate the exchange. So I think better days are coming um, um, uh, and I certainly look forward to Connecticut having better days with more uh, 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 getting out of the, uh, the ditch that we're in. Um, as far as that, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, uh, I think we all, we, we've got to find a way to discourage people from using emergency rooms as general health care. I think that that's uh, one of the things that's behind uh, the federal movement. Governor, thank you for taking the time to take my time out of my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Robert?
autism, developmental disabilities, brain injuries, uh, and mental illness. And we are a, a, a part of a very large private provider network here in Connecticut. We believe we are the safety net for your most fragile citizens. And also part of what we believe is the solution to some of the state uh, budget issues that you're facing. And as an example of that, a year ago, we assumed operation of the state-run group home right here in Danbury for eight men with developmental disabilities. Uh, the home was in bad condition. Uh, they did not meet licensing standards. We don't believe it met our standards. The consumers, families, guardians were understandably nervous about the transition. And I'm happy to tell you that a year later, the home has been renovated, the consumers are happy, the families are happy, the guardians are happy, and the home is well run. And it's more cost effective for us to be as a private provider. Uh, so if I have to turn this around to a question, my question would be, um, will you challenge uh, the state bureaucracy and private providers to provide uh, cost-effective, efficient, and high-quality services through private providers like the building and disability? Yeah, if, uh, uh, quite clearly we will, uh, and we are. Uh, for the great service uh, that you're providing. I, I think one of the problems uh, with Connecticut over a long period of time is we've not treated the not-for-profit community provider, um, uh, community providers well uh, during a period of time in which uh, state expenditures were going up by six and seven percent per year. Uh, our allocation for not-for-profits and community providers was about, actually it was less than one percent a year. Uh, this budget actually continues the process of supporting and increasing support for the not-for-profit community provider uh, community if we, uh, if we get this budget through. So uh, I, I'm not just using words, I'm actually demonstrating. But I, I do want to thank you for your work. Thank you. Rail line. 
Uh, and that's part of that decision-making process. And we're identifying a, a million dollars to undertake all of the study work. If, if it indicates that that's viable, then we'll be very aggressive in Washington in going after uh, rail dollars in Washington, which are being made available to, to reinvigorate that line. I understand we disagree on that, but I just wanted to give you that explanation. Thank you. expenses in, in uh, year two. But I'm going to be honest with you, it doesn't reflect uh, as much money as we're actually going to need. Uh, the assumptions that we're building into year two um, is that by this reorganization that we're undertaking, we're going to identify sufficient savings to allow us to live within that budget. Um, uh, understand that we're currently living uh, with, a, with in, in this budget year, a budget that was designed two years ago. Um, we're going to live uh, with the exception of uh, uh, some additional money for health care, specifically um, around hospitals and nursing homes, uh, and uh, uh, some additional transit money. Uh, we're going to live on less money next year, um, and quite frankly, doing a third year in a row uh, where we see Medicaid expenses going up rapidly uh, is probably an impossibility, but I'm going to work as hard as I can at it. Next we were in New Britain last night. The mayor there is Tim Stewart. That's Good evening, Governor. Good evening. Thank you for taking my question. Sure. In an interview with Shelley Sinlin, you stated that when I, I discussed the deficit in the budget at the time, and you stated that you are not going to be able to tax your way out of this. And my question is, how do you consider the 1.5 billion tax increase in your budget, not taxing that way out of this? Well, what I said is we can't tax our way out of it, we can't cut our way out of it. $3.5 billion are now adjusted to $3.3 billion. Uh, neither one of those would work. But you raise the question. So let's then you know, do what I, I'll do with you publicly what I do uh, every day. I, I benchmark what other states are doing. I understand uh, and study uh, how they've got the points uh, that they have. Uh, if you look at the governors who are uh, suggesting uh, large-scale cuts in the budget, and you then scratch the surface. Uh, for instance, in New Jersey, over a two-year period of time, they're switching $3.6 billion of government, state government expense to local government. That's not a cut. That's, you take my problem, and I get to take credit for having solved it. But, but there's a danger in Connecticut that, that uh, is pretty profound, and that is that we're already more reliant on property taxes than any other state in the nation. Uh, and for many of our largest employers, uh, a company like United Technologies that has 26,000 people here, the largest tax that they pay to the state uh, is property taxes because they have these gigantic facilities and lots uh, of, of, of property and buildings and that sort of thing. If we start to shift uh, very rapidly state expenses to local governments, now we've done it over a 20-year period of time, and I'm trying to stop that, but if we all of a sudden uh, did what other states are doing, and shifted that obligation to local governments and just kind of washed our hands of it. Or if I had passed on the $271 million cut that the prior governor made the ECS formula, that would have shown up in your property tax. Um, 
uh, you can say what you want, and a lot of people want my tax structure to be even more progressive than it is. Uh, property tax is a pretty regressive way to, to, to raise money. If you look at uh, New York State, because um, uh, some people will throw it out and say, why don't you do what uh, Governor Cuomo did? And I'm not attacking Governor Cuomo. He's, he's leading his state. But we've got to analyze what's going on. Uh, in that state, a $10 million cut, uh, the, the largest single portion of which, $4.65 billion, is represented in the shifting of state requirements to local government. Uh, one, one community uh, in New York State loses $685 million uh, in educational funding. Now, I talked about, under the, the budget that I inherited, Danbury losing six and a half million over a two-year period of time. Um, uh, if, if we didn't plug the ECS hole. So, I, I've gone a different way. And, and you are absolutely right. There's only, there's probably only five of us in the country, governors, that are doing it this way. But there's nobody who's a governor of a state that's more dependent on property taxes than I am. Uh, and I have been true to what I said. I almost lost this election. And I was willing to lose this election because I would not take, I would not make a promise which I knew was impossible to keep. Never did I say I wouldn't raise taxes. I'd say I didn't want to raise taxes, it'd be the, the final thing I would do, but I never said it. And I, and by the way, I was running against a guy who, <laughs> not, not this guy. solve a three and a half billion dollar deficit by cutting expenses by two billion dollars. <laughs> so, uh, honestly, I think I'm being true to my word. I'm doing the best I can, and I'm explaining to you why I'm not going down the same road that other states are. Different way, you know, when my wife Kathy and I were raising our family, you know, we could afford the, the 
send our kids, and most people who can't afford to send their kids to uh, an early childhood uh, educational experience do. That, that's just the simple reality. Um, which means that when kids get to school who haven't had that experience, uh, they're competing against a whole bunch of kids who do. Uh, they meet, in fact, a 34-year-old standard. Uh, they come to school ready to learn. Uh, but the kids who don't have that experience show up not knowing their letters or their colors or having had a formalized learning experience. In essence, if you study how the achievement gap turns kids out in high school and the correlation between that gap and the lack of an early childhood learning experience, it's pretty dramatic. So this budget includes about $6.1 million additional uh, for early childhood uh, educational experiences. And I will tell you right up front, I wish it could be more. Uh, in a more robust economy, it probably could be. Uh, but at the moment, uh, it's a down payment. Sir, that's, um, that's very true. Um, and also, thank you very much for the um, early childhood um, cabinet that you're um, in the process of uh, developing. I think that's great, and I thank you very much. This is the question, though, um, between preschool, a four-year-old, and a current fifth grader and junior high person in high school, what are we going to do about these kids right now? Because they are quickly our next labor force. Sure, so, I, 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 again, well, I'm just trying to take, uh, give you, a, I mean, a lot of people are not, so I'm trying to give you parts of that. But I can't read your mind and can't, can't be sure of what part of the education program you want me to talk about. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, in the state of Connecticut, education is a local issue. Um, and uh, how your community uh, decides to spend its money is, is up to it. Uh, one of the reasons I, I'm very proud of this budget uh, is that we closed the, uh, um, the ECS gap of $271 million. Um, I wish we could add money, uh, but we can't. Um, and so in making the same amount of money available to communities as we made this year, uh, I'm not uh, 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 passing that obligation on to, other, to, to your community uh, to make up the difference. And, and uh, as well as we're finding other ways to be supportive of educational improvement. And I have to be honest with you, I'm going to have a, a state uh, education department that holds people to higher standards. Um, so those are some of the other things. Right, the next speaker then is David. Hi, David. Governor, Senate Governor, thank you for coming to Danbury. Uh, I listened to your uh, State of the State message on WTHC Radio uh, when you presented it. And uh, one thing that certainly uh, perked my ears was when you mentioned about the state vocational technical high school system, that it's a very good system, and we plan on turning these over to the city with about two years of money. And I could not understand at all why that was even thought of. Uh, the vocational technical high school, which many people here in Danbury recognizes Henry Evans Technical School, it works great. It's an agency that actually works well. <laughs> I think everybody can agree on that. Uh, to try to even tamper with that is a bad, bad move. It would be like taking the, uh, getting rid of the state police and having local police take over the state highway system. It doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm, in fact, I'm a product of the vocational technical high school system. But I can tell the governor that every child uh, is, does not, should not be going to go tech school to begin with. Uh, it's, it's not a place where you're just going to make a birdhouse or make some key chains like they have in some other states. They go there for about two hours and learn a little something. The vocational technical high schools here in Danbury, and throughout our state, we have about 17 of them. Uh, they learn a trade not only do they get the high school education, but they also walk away with a trade. With that trade, they can create their own business, work for a business instantly, and are taxpayers here. They don't go out to another state. You know, when I, I want to, uh, I, as I said, I graduated many, many years ago, and when we run a, uh, a reunion for Henry of Tech, we don't have to go on Google or, or Twitter. We just look at the yellow pages, because the yellow pages are where the graduates are. That's where the graduates are. I know it's been off, it's on the table for about a year to study it. I was wondering if we could get a commitment from you tonight is let's not talk about that at all. Let's continue the good thing that the state is doing with the Botech system. It's not something that's needed to be studied. You're actually doing something very well now. It doesn't need that improvement. Well, I, I gotta, I, listen, I, I agree with so much of what you said. But it's not, you know, that the quality that you're talking about is not universal uh, throughout the state system. It really isn't. Um, and there are, there are uh, Botech schools that aren't producing 
kinds of results that, that you're talking about. So, you know, the, this may not be the right tool to, to reconnect some of those vocational uh, technical programs with their community. We'll, we'll take a look at how to strengthen that commitment on a local basis and to make sure that local communities are having appropriate levels of input uh, uh, to the schools. Uh, so we'll work with you. The state's doing a great job, Governor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, and I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Governor, but I'm going to ask all the speakers if you could please come up, don't make a statement, ask the question, only because we don't want to run out of time, we want a lot of people to speak. The next, uh, the next person is Patty. Good morning. Good evening, my name is Patty Kegas, and welcome to Danbury. I am here representing over 300 adults who have participated in leadership training institutes here. Yeah in Danbury, uh, the PLTI, the Parent Leadership Training Institute. If I can have everyone stand who has been involved with PLTI. Governor, I wish to say thank you to you, to you, to Lieutenant Governor, for providing the means for us to have the opportunity for this for parents in our city. We have over 300 graduates. Because of the work done by you and Elaine Zimmerman at the Great Connecticut Commission on Children, we have a parent trust fund in our state that enables our local communities to invest in citizens. And so we are graduates of a 20-week Harvard-level course on civics and democracy. Um, I wish that you would um, maintain the commission. And so I, my question is to you is about the, about the commissions. All right, I, I, it's fun. It's in the budget. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Don't anyone take the lieutenant governor's job away. Governor, this is Bill. Hey, Bill. All right. Fine, Governor. Thank you for coming. Sure. Governor, Mr. Mayor, it's a pleasure to see you all here in the room. I know it's great. I know it's coming. Uh, I'm a resident of Danbury. I'm retired. Uh, I'm a Republican with a, very with a very strong affinity for the Tea Party Patriots and all the good work that they're doing. I will admit to having some sympathy for you having uh, watched you take the oath of office and inherit a $3 billion deficit. Uh, but I'm sure you were aware that six or eight years of Democratic-controlled legislature provided you with that. I also understand that you're looking to the state employee unions to provide about 30% of the revenue necessary to balance your budget. The question is, how many of these unions have, co have come forward and expressed their willingness to talk to you about this? How many have just turned their back on you? And if that source of revenue is not there to balance the budget, where are you going to get it from? Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I don't want to be overly political, but you pointed out that the Democrats in the legislature, I'll point out to you that we've had Republican governors for 20 years. Um, and, and I think and I think very clear that, that I don't think that the combination, um, uh, actually I don't think anyone's blameless in this. So uh, uh, I didn't serve in the legislature. I think bad decisions were made in the legislature. I think bad decisions were made by prior governors, and I'm trying to straighten it out. You asked a specific question, has anyone walked away? No, no union has walked away. We're in discussions, um, and those discussions will continue. Uh, you asked a second question, what will happen if we don't get those concessions? Uh, we're going to cut the budget. The next person is Scott. Thank you, Governor. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Scott. Hey. And what's, uh, what's that a hat Yukon Huskies. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I want to say this, Scott, but you notice I got elected and they won the national championship. <laughs> Good, so I'll get elected next year, too. <laughs> okay, I'll keep this brief. I'm a musician in the community, and I read, if correct me if I'm wrong, that there's a proposed tax on performance venues coming up in the state of Connecticut. I just want to make sure I have that correct. Like I said, this is something I read briefly. Maybe it's not true or not. It, 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 an entrance tax, I mean, a tax on tickets? Is that tickets, venues, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Now, the increased revenue that supposedly that's going to provide, will that 
revenue in turn go back to the bankers themselves or they're just going to use it to balance other parts of the budget? Well, I, actually, it's, it's a fair question. Uh, this budget actually uh, puts $15 million uh, in uh, culture and tourism. Um, uh, the current uh, budget has $1 uh, for, uh, uh, to advertise the state of Connecticut, to promote the state of Connecticut. You know, when you watch TV in the morning, you see Michigan advertised, or you see Williamsburg, or in another week or so, you'll start to see Cape Cod. Our state doesn't do that. Uh, nor have we uh, 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 kept current uh, in, in supporting cultural institutions. So yes, there's an entrance tax uh, that will be applicable, and yes, we're putting $15 million into culture and tourism. Tourism, yes. Okay, thank you very much. that BESBY serves graduate high school. The national average for high school graduation is 68%. 50% of the vocational rehabilitation clients that BESBY has find jobs. That's the highest rate in the country. It's 20% higher than the national average and 30% higher than the uh, average for uh, the Bureau of Rehab Services under DSS. If you go to the Federal Department of Education and RSA websites, you will find that there is unequivocal evidence that in the 26 states that have consolidated their state agencies for the blind into larger bureaucracies, literacy rates go down, high school graduation rates go down, job placements go down, and annual average salaries for blind people who work go down. According to the Office of Policy and Management, this consolidation plan of yours will save $300,000, or approximately a little less than eight one thousandths of 1% of the state deficit. Uh, quite honestly, Governor, it doesn't make sense to me either fiscally or logically. We want to be tax payers, not tax consumers. How do you justify your consolidation plan? Uh, thank you. First of all, we maintain our commitment to uh, people who are blind. I, I pointed this out on other occasions. I'll point it out uh, here. Uh, at the end of my father's life, uh, he was legally blind. And, I uh, certainly understand the issue uh, to a very uh, great extent. Um, uh, having said that, uh, we need to, to, we have right now 81 silos that are budgeted in the state of Connecticut, uh, and there's a fair amount of overlap. And although you're right, the first year savings is expected to be about $300,000, I think there's there's substantial additional savings that can be had. Sure. Uh, I also so believe, sir, excuse me, I also believe uh, that ultimately what we have to do is make sure that those additional uh, savings, uh, as we restructure that organization, um, uh, uh, is, is plowed back into service delivery. So I, I stand ready to commit to you um, that we're going we're to honor that commitment. By the way, a lot of that commitment is based on individual laws that require the state to provide services, and we're not changing those laws. So we're going to continue to do that. I understand there's a disagreement, but you know, I've got a $3.3 billion deficit. Um, and that, that de deficit doesn't get much smaller the second year unless we uh, address that issue. It would be about $3 uh, billion in the second year. So what we're doing is trying to find savings where we can, when we can, uh, and we're trying to build savings not just in the first year of that budget, uh, but all subsequent years. But we're going to honor our commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Here's the beer. Hello, uh, Governor, how are you? Thank you for coming. Sure. I just got a follow up question to actually, Chris, as I'm a parent of a 16 year old daughter who's blind who's now attending in town high school and she's getting ready to get herself ready for college and she just wrote a SAT, so she's actually quite independent. She's been uh, using the Fesby services since she was about four and a half. Um, make my long story really short 2007 to 2010, we moved to Ontario, Canada because my husband is doing a fellowship there. Um, and the um, model that you're proposing for Vesby is exactly the model that they were using. Um, 
And what was happening was the fact that uh, as much as your commitment, I know is good of mine, and I do not, um, I, I, from my heart, know that. It's just that, practically speaking, I see that it does not work because the, um, the local schools are not prepared when these um, the services are supposed to like that. Um, we actually had to send her to the school 30 minutes away uh, because that was the only school that would take her, her local school would not take her. Um, I actually then started introducing sort of the best principals to the school boards. Um, they were very excited about what I had to bring. Um, and they started implementing those. And because of my involvement with that, I was actually appointed by the um, Minister of Education at the time onto their advisory committee to help with all of that. The bottom line really ends up being is the reason they actually moved back because I did a wonderful job in Ontario was because I knew that when I came back, the transition from high school, the transition from throughout her life is going to be pretty seamless. There I was fighting for every single tiny thing, even to have real material on her desk at the time of the other children. Um, I knew many students that fell through the cracks. And I'm only telling you this because it's really, I lived it for three years. Uh, it was probably the most frustrating three years of my life. Um, bottom line, really, I know your commitment is to the blind community. I know you're looking at services not changing. But practically speaking, um, it does change as much as you think it won't change. I don't see how you can guarantee that these services will not change, how we can have seamless services from a child that's born to adult life. The, their services are so specialized, so unique, the number of blind people are so few. I just really, I really question that. I highly question that. Well, I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing your story, and thank you for your uh, hard work on behalf of your daughter and her success, and I've heard everything you said, and we'll take it into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Way that was set up, I, I gotta look this way, so I do apologize. Hi, Governor, thanks for the opportunity. Sure. Um, the Department of Revenue Services issued a report that states two thirds of the companies making money in Connecticut in 2008 paid no corporate tax. Um, one big example, of course, is Bank of America, whose CEO last year himself made a bonus of $9 million, and there's been no contribution to the state of Connecticut. Um, I know that you've said that um, you're concerned that corporations and the super wealthy may pick up and move if asked to contribute more in taxes. But my question is, is how really is this a, a shared, fair sacrifice for everyone involved? It seems that the middle class is really just being trampled upon. Well, you know, uh, 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 first of all, let's, let's be very clear. Uh, the reason that two thirds of corporations don't pay tax is they're, they are a subchapter S corporation. So when you use that number, uh, which means they pay their uh, their tax through their the owner's personal income tax. So, what, so when you use that statistic, it's really not telling the truth or the whole story. Uh, because most corporations in the state of Connecticut uh, are very small, and they're set up for a specific purpose. Uh, if you did catering, uh, and you were a single employee, you'd probably be a subchapter S. You want to be a corporation to ensure uh, that you don't lose your house if there was some, something that went wrong, but you're paying a tax, and you're paying a tax on the income. Uh, with respect to Bank of America, listen, I'm not defending Bank of America. Uh, there is a reality that they, they paid a tax when, when they made money. You're picking a year where, when nationally they didn't make money. They actually lost a lot of money. Uh, and that got passed on to a number of states. Not, that got passed on to a number of states, not just Connecticut. But if you go back the year before, they paid taxes. And I'm betting you they're going to pay for amount of taxes uh, this year. because they're, they're doing pretty well. Now, you, you could also then talk about a national trend. At one point uh, in the 50 states, about 30% uh, uh, of state revenue came from corporate income tax. Uh, and the average in the United States has shrunk very substantially. It's somewhere in the, the low uh, or mid single uh, digits. That happened because states decided that A, they wanted to compete with one another, but B, uh, they were seeing a fair amount of uh, jobs move elsewhere. Um, and they thought that that was a good way to compete. Now, our tax structure is very much benchmarked on the corporate level against the states that we compete with. 
Uh, we compete uh, geographically, uh, most with uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, and then, of course, the other 45 states. And then, of course, every other nation in the world. There are many countries that don't have any corporate income tax. Um, that's an incentive to offshore. Uh, there are states that have lower rates than we do, and there are states that have higher rates than we do. But here I am, I'm, I'm a governor in a state that has the highest electric rates um, in, uh, uh, in the country, uh, and 18% higher than the rest of New England. So what I try to do, and what I'm trying to do, and we can argue whether I'm doing it properly, I understand that, um, is find the right balance so that we can start to grow jobs in the state of Connecticut again. Um, and if we raise uh, corporate taxes uh, uh, on a uh, United Technologies, for instance, they just closed the plant in Cheshire and move those jobs to Georgia and Singapore. Uh, we start to do, we start to make single decisions on our own part as a state, and we further damage uh, what's left of the competitive advantage that we have, or we go to a situation where we have no competitive advantage, then we're going we're gonna to repeat in the next 22 years what we've done so successfully in the last 22 years which is to lose jobs. There are only two states in the nation that lost jobs in that period of time, Michigan and Connecticut. And Michigan actually retained a higher percentage of their jobs than we did. So we've got to change that trend. Uh, and we've got to benchmark uh, uh, our tax system. Uh, and I'm, I'm willing to have conversations with members of the legislature and anybody. Um, but understand that that's what I'm trying to do. That's the context in which we're trying to get this thing going. That's the context in which we're making these decisions, which is not a decision, it's a recommendation. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Hi. Um, my name is Evan Hack. I'm a pediatrician in Norfolk. Uh, whose practice has proudly served our Medicaid patients in the region for over 20 years. And I'm currently the president of the medical staff at the Norfolk Hospital. Uh, the proposed budget hospital tax uh, stands to have the Norfolk Hospital losing $1.6 million and the Bayberry Hospital $5.4 million. Uh, the hospital tax, as I understand it, is very disproportionate as some hospitals stand to be more negatively impacted, such as ours, than other hospitals in the state. Um, not only does you know, the hospital be negatively impacted, but the communities we serve as well, uh, from the standpoint of the local economies, and I think also ultimately increase the cost of health care. So my question is, can you sit down with hospitals and physicians to come up with an alternative to the tax, or at the very least, a uh, more equitable form? Sure. Uh, uh, thank you for the, the point. Uh, as you know, most hospitals actually get more money than that. A lot of that has to do with the amount of Medicaid uh, and uh, unreimbursed uh, treatment that those hospitals make. Um, I think that there's a later run with respect to Danbury where actually Danbury ends up getting more money uh, based on their having corrected some information uh, uh, previously supplied to the state. Um, so before we throw the, uh, uh, the bathwater out, we might want to check uh, whether that's right. But I'm on, I've, I've been led to believe that the most recent runs actually show Danbury uh, uh, gaining money. Uh, I don't know uh, with respect uh, to New Milford uh, standing here, but I'm sure we could run those numbers. And, and having said all of that, we've got a $3.3 billion deficit. So uh, we're, we're trying to uh, have a system that, that taps into all of the federal revenue that we can get. And by having that tax, we will tap into a substantial amount of additional amount of federal revenue. Hi. Um, thank you for taking the time to answer my question. I'm going to make this a quick summary. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm Rachel Goldberg. Um, I am the statewide secretary of People's First, uh, which is an organization that helps people with physical and mental disabilities. Um, people with disabilities are still the most neglected minority in this country and state. And I know from personal experience that there are many people with disabilities that rely on staff and job coaches to get themselves to work and to do other daily activities. Um, 
And I think we are able-bodied. We don't really understand, from my experience, what, how hard the daily activity is um, for us to do. And we just want the same wishes. They have the same wishes and dreams as other people in the able-bodied world. And I just wanted to let you know that. And my question is, well, what are you going to do? Because we're supposed to have our, um, we're supposed to have our funds cut. And there's so many people with disabilities that still need help. And the transportation is a very serious issue. Most of us don't drive. Uh, thank you.
will be secure. Yeah. Well, I know, so I, I, I can assure you that I'm going to do everything in my power to make your kids uh, future uh, secure. But that's what I'm trying to do uh, in the context in which there's a $3.3 billion budget, overwhelmingly the not-for-profit uh, and community provider network is supporting what I'm doing. They understand uh, what I'm trying to do. That's not to say that there are going to be, not going to be changes. Because there is an inefficiency built into how state governments operate. And I've got to squeeze that inefficiency out. If, if our state is to be sustainable uh, out into the future, uh, and if we're ever going to begin the process of growing jobs again, we've got to change our behaviors. Um, but, but understand this, that, that my commitment to people with disabilities is, is pretty strong. Um, and, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to take two more questions, and then I will ask the rest of the people that are online uh, to please see Aaron over here um, with your questions and concerns, and he will answer them either by email or some other way. Uh, but I apologize. So the next speaker, please come up. Dan. Hey, Dan. I want to commend you for being willing to uh, at least put some tax increases on the table. I was preempted largely a few moments ago, but uh, this is a high income earning state. Incomes are skewed uh, to a relatively small number of very, very wealthy people. Uh, some of their income is not earned through a valuable social contribution. It's earned through monopoly, it's earned through political preference, through lobbying, through campaign contribution. And I hope you'll be tough. I just hope you'll be tough. I appreciate the governor, um, or before this budget gets passed, we have three brackets. Um, I'm making it progressive in the sense that there will be eight brackets, um, and in each one of those brackets, uh, wealthy people will pay more taxes. We have luxury taxes built into this budget. We have throwback rules for corporations. We have other rules that we're, we're doing. Uh, I think some of that just doesn't get out over the, over the messaging. Um, and. Uh, uh, I, on the other hand, I will tell you that, that I'm a big believer in benchmarking and not putting my state at a competitive disadvantage. Some people would say by being one of the few governors who's actually proposing raising taxes, I'm doing that, and I understand that, that that's their argument. Uh, I, I just hope that I don't get penalized by the folks that I'm trying to help uh, in, in doing that. I, I could have done what, what other governors did, but I had to make decisions based on circumstances in Connecticut understanding our over-reliance on property tax and what sliding a, a, a $4.65 billion obligation, as is the case in New York, or a $3.6 billion obligation in the state of New Jersey, or in other states would have meant. It doesn't mean I have the right answer. I've heard lots of people, lots of input, and I, and I appreciate it all, uh, and we're trying to find the right way to do it. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, unfunded public liabilities are all over the news today. Uh, a recent study estimated that the gap market value of Connecticut's unfunded pension and retiree health liability at $76 billion or four times our total annual budget. I know you will agree that $77 million of current pension funding is not a drop in the bucket when compared to even the official unfunded estimate of $48 billion. Last August, you said, quote, it's the culmination of years of budget trickery and a refusal to address looming problems, unquote. And then you went on to say that you would establish a plan to, quote, see that they are fully funded and that contributions are made on a yearly basis, unquote. If you consider it budget trickery to not include unfunded liabilities, why are they not included in your budget? Uh, they are, actually, let's be very clear. They, they, We've studied that. They are disclosed. Um, and, and the reason that I'm funding pensions at the full actuarial uh, price tag of $877 million is to honor that commitment. Uh, but, but beyond that, you quoted GAP, generally accepted accounting principles. For the state, which the state of Connecticut requires the mayor uh, and your superintendent of schools to report on, but has exempted itself. I'm changing that. So Connecticut will be GAP compliant. 
generally accepted accounting principles will apply. We will be transparent. We will uh, document our long-term obligations, and we will fully fund those uh, obligations. That's why people say, well, why do you, you know, hey, let me put it differently. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the legislature, the governor, and it was the governor's initial suggestion, by the way, um, uh, went into negotiations uh, with the unions uh, and said, well, we need, we need some givebacks. Uh, the largest single giveback that they garnered two years ago was an agreement that the state didn't have to put about $300 million into the pension plan. Guess who has to do that? <laughs> Delaying a payment is not a savings. That's why going the gap is so important. And that's why I'm doing it. Uh, and that's why uh, I'm putting my, uh, I'm putting money, I can't say my money, I'm putting money uh, behind what I'm saying. We are, for the first time uh, in anyone's recent hit, uh, memory, fully funding our pension obligations to the tune of $877 uh, million. And at the same time, that we're looking to restructure uh, our arrangements with our, our employees. Both things are hard to do. I'm trying to do both. Thank you. Down and one more to go. Thank you very much. Have a great night.